Most of us now recognize the threat that climate change poses to us and to future generations. But it seems so hard to take action because it seems like such a huge and complex topic. Our research aims to simplify this topic by generating a more spatial and holistic perspective of the climate crisis to guide more effective and targeted strategies to fight it. Because there's a greater threat that underpins climate change. That's the loss of biodiversity. When we lose natural ecosystems, carbon is emitted into the atmosphere. But much, much more importantly, these ecosystems are the regulatory systems for our planet. They're the lungs that draw down carbon from the atmosphere and they store it in the soil. This is an example of that regulatory system. It's carbon dioxide movement throughout the year. And you can see the high concentrations of carbon in the high latitudes indicated by red colors. But as we move through time and we tick into late spring and then summer, we'll see these colors start to fade. And that's driven by one thing. It's the emergence of leaves on trees. This very simple ecological process that we're all familiar with has a huge impact on the carbon cycle every year, and it regulates our climate. And it's one of several massive ecological systems that balance one another out. In contrast, what we're starting to see now are the human emissions. Around the world, the industrialized parts of the world, you can see we emit about nine or 10 gigatons of carbon per year. But it's not offset by any uptake, so we're gradually warming the climate. Given the massive, massive scale of the ecological processes, and their control on the carbon cycle. Managing those systems effectively is undoubtedly one of our best chances to capture that nine or 10 gigatons. But it's not that simple, because managing these systems without understanding them can be ineffective, or often it can be damaging. There's thousands of examples of ecosystem restoration or management gone wrong. The eradication of sparrows in China during the 1950s was intended to increase crop yields. But instead, without the sparrows, insect populations boomed, and they decimated crops across the country. And this was one of the contributing factors to the Great Chinese Famine, which killed over 30 million people. And there's thousands of other examples just like this all throughout society, where trees have been restored in the wrong ecosystems, and they've destroyed natural biodiversity. Or, or they've been planted in soils that can't support them. And when they fall and die, those soils get degraded and nutrients are lost. It's been estimated that only 30% of trees planted in tropical regions around the world make it until maturity. What these restoration projects need, these are the restoration projects that are saving us against climate change and biodiversity loss. But what they need is information about which species to restore, which soils can support them, and what the ecological consequences will be. Because until recently, we didn't even know the first thing about the global forest system. We didn't know how many trees there were to start with. That's because most of our information, in fact, all of our global scale information, comes from satellite data, which has fantastic global coverage, and it's giving us insights that we never thought we'd have. But it can't help us to see below the canopy surface. So there was an estimate of the trees on Earth using satellite data of about 400 billion trees. And this has been fantastic for guiding, uh, guiding restoration targets and strategies around the world. But in our lab, we knew that really getting a handle on this information required something more. It required boots on the ground. It required information from people around the world who'd studied their forests and categorized those ecosystems. But this is only plot level information. But when we combine that information across the global forest system, we start to get a global perspective. And when we combine that with satellite data and climate information and soil characteristics, we can start to explore the spatial patterns in tree density across the globe to reveal that there are, in fact, slightly over three trillion trees on the planet. This is almost 10 times bigger than that previous estimate. And it really helps to put everything in perspective. Because this also helps us to understand that if we manage these ecosystems effectively, there's room for an additional 1.2 trillion trees. And these could capture an, an additional 150 gigatons of carbon. This map also helps us to see below the canopy surface so that we can start to understand the structure of the forests. And now we're making this map 
come alive by inserting it into Esri's living atlas. So people can explore those regions. You can zoom into your region of interest and identify how many trees exist and how much capacity there is for new trees in those areas. But we're not stopping there. There's ad additional layers of forest information, like the, like the diversity of those forests. So we can estimate which trees can be supported and how many species could survive there. And we can estimate how much carbon those forests capture, so the climate impact. And in particular, we're now trying to understand the impact for the temperature. Because what a lot of people don't know is that although the vast majority of forests do cool the climate by capturing carbon from the atmosphere, in some regions, dark colored forests actually absorb a lot of the sun's energy. And that means they can warm the climate. So targeting the right areas is going to be absolutely essential. But now we're getting this global perspective on the above ground world. The next steps are the sort of holy grail in restoration science. It's the billions of species that exist below our feet, the soil organisms. This is the most diverse community on the terrestrial biosphere. They regulate the atmosphere that we need to breathe. They determine climate conditions and the fertility of soils for forests and for plants. For decades, soil scientists have been taking samples all around the world to characterize those billions of species and explore the immense diversity in these systems. And what we're finding is that by far the most abundant animals in these systems are tiny microscopic worms called nematodes. These nematodes fill every role in the trophic food web. They f fill a whole range of functions, but we know so little about them. It appears that the soil is teeming with them. It's been estimated that four out of every five of the animals on this planet is a tiny nematode worm, and yet we know nothing about their distributions or impact at a global scale. But now we're starting to get machines that can process these samples much more quickly, and we can generate a whole new wave of information. And I'd love to show you some of the stuff that we're working on just at the moment to explore their spatial patterns. So this reveals all the thousands of locations around the world where people have been taking soil samples and extracting those nematodes to identify their abundances. And if we cl click on one of the samples, we can see the total abundance of nematodes in those soils, in, in a gram of soil. We can also see the different composition with all the different groups. But more importantly, we can see that across the, for across the, the world's soil, there's immense variability. Some samples have 400 nematodes for a gram of soil. Others will have 170,000 in just a gram of soil. We needed to understand what's explaining this immense difference, what's causing these differences. So we ran a random forest uh, variable, variable importance metric to identify the main drivers. And we expected, like above ground animals, that it would be climate. You know, as, as things get warmer towards the tropics, we see more and more and more above ground animals. But in the below ground world, we see that it's not climate, it's the soil characteristics that structure the diversity and density. It's the organic carbon stocks, the amount of carbon in the soil, or the depth of that soil, and the geological characteristics. And by extrapolating that information across the global system, we start to get a new perspective of the below ground world. For the very first time, we can see below our feet. This helps us to see those correlations, you can see that impact of, of, of soil carbon. You can see the, in the high latitude regions where there's a huge accumulation of carbon in the soil driven by cold temperatures. In those regions, you do see this huge accumulation of these soil animals. This also helps us to identify which soils are alive, which, which ones are active, can support forests and, and plants, and which ones need restoring before, restoration, before plants can be plant restored there. But it also helps us to give a global perspective. Because forever, we've always thought that there are more animals in the tropics than the Arctic. But this glimpse below the surface is helping us to realize that it may well be the other way around. So as we compile these layers upon layers of information, of, of, of climate and biodiversity information, we can now address some of the most important and long-standing questions in ecology. One of the first things that every restoration to, uh, project asks is, if I'm planting 100 trees, should I have a combination, a mixture of species, a mixture of tree species, or just one, the fastest growing tree species? And for a long time, scientists haven't had the answer because things differ in, in locations around the world. But now, with this global perspective, we can layer information on top of each other to find a global answer. And we find consistently across the world 
multi-species combinations are always better for capturing carbon and producing wood. That's because different tree species have different strategies for capturing those nutrients and resources in the soil or sunlight. And that means they can be much more effective as a community. The diversity is much more effective. This helped us to estimate that at a global scale, those impacts really add up. We see that currently, in terms of timber and pulp and paper, the global timber market, the global forests are worth approximately $616 billion per year. If we were to convert the current world's forests into a monoculture of just one, the fastest growing species, that value would fall by about $300 billion per year. That's just the value of diversity. That's if we have the same number of trees. That's a massive impact of diversity on our global system. And that doesn't even touch all of the foods and medicines and carbon capture and, and climate sequestration that they, that they contr contribute. Biodiversity is so essential. Now we're getting this spatial understanding, the science of where, for this natural world. And we're, we're starting to be able to guide restoration projects to be so much more effective. What we really need now is engagement. We want to learn from the Esri community, from the modeling world, so that we can capture more and more and more information and improve the spatial quality of our models so that we can all together guide decision makers to make effective decisions in the fight against climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you.